It was a big, dull brick house, exactly like all the others in its row, but that on the front door there shone a brass plate, on which was engraved in black letters, Miss Minchin, Select Seminary for Young Ladies. Here we are, Sarah, said Captain Crewe, making his voice sound as cheerful as possible. Then he lifted her out of the cab and they mounted the steps and rang the bell. Sarah often thought afterward that the house was somehow exactly like Miss Minchin. It was respectable and well furnished, but everything in it was ugly, and the very armchairs seemed to have had hard bones in them. In the hall everything was hard and polished, even the red cheeks of the moon face on the tall clock in the corner had a severe, varnished look. The drawing-room into which they were ushered was covered by a carpet with a square pattern upon it. The chairs were square, and a heavy marble timepiece stood upon the heavy marble mantel. As she sat down in one of the stiff mahogany chairs, Sarah cast one of her quick looks about her. I don't like it, Papa, she said. But then I dare say soldiers, even brave ones, don't really like going into battle. Captain Crewe laughed outright at this, he was young and full of fun, and he never tired of hearing Sarah's queer speeches. Oh, little Sarah, he said. What shall I do when I have no one to say solemn things to me? No one else is as solemn as you are. But why do solemn things make you laugh so? inquired Sarah. <laughs> because you are such fun when you say them, he answered, laughing still more. And then suddenly he swept her into his arms and kissed her very hard, stopping laughing all at once, and looking almost as if tears had come into his eyes. It was just then that Miss Minchin entered the room. She was very like her house, Sarah felt, tall and dull and respectable and ugly. She had large, cold, fishy eyes, and a large, cold, fishy smile, it spread itself into a very large smile when she saw Sarah and Captain Crewe. She had heard a great many desirable things of the young soldier, from the lady who had recommended her school to him. Among other things, she had heard that he was a rich father, who was willing to spend a great deal of money on his little daughter. It will be a great privilege to have charge of such a beautiful and promising child, Captain Crewe, she said taking Sarah's hand and stroking it. Lady Meredith has told me of her unusual cleverness. A clever child is a great treasure in an establishment like mine. Sarah stood quietly, with her eyes fixed upon Miss Minchin's face. She was thinking something odd, as usual. Why does she say I am a beautiful child? She was thinking. I am not beautiful at all. Colonel Granger's little girl, Isabel, is beautiful. She has dimples and rose-coloured cheeks and long hair the colour of gold. I have short black hair and green eyes. Besides which, I am a thin child and not fair in the least. I am one of the ugliest children I ever saw. She is beginning by telling a story. She was mistaken, however, in thinking that she was an ugly child. She was not in the least like Isabel Grange, who had been the beauty of the regiment, but she had an odd charm of her own. She was a slim, supple creature, rather tall for her age, and had an intense, attractive little face. Her hair was heavy and quite black, and only curled at the tips. Her eyes were greenish-grey, it is true, but they were big, wonderful eyes, with long black lashes, and though she herself did not like the colour of them, many other people did. Still, she was very firm in her belief that she was an ugly little girl, and she was not at all elated by Miss Minchin's flattery. I should be telling a story if I said she was beautiful, she thought, and I should know I was telling a story. I believe I'm as ugly as she is, in my way. What did she say that for? After she had known Miss Minchin longer, she learned why she had said it. She discovered that she said the same thing to each papa and mamma who brought a child to her school.